Good morning and welcome to the Morning Scoop for Thursday, December 24th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The Sugar Bowl against Clemson is in eight days. The game against Michigan in 338 days. Before we fully shift into a Sugar Bowl preview mode after Christmas, we wanted to take you know one last look back at the Big Ten Championship game. It was one of the more baffling games I think most Ohio State fans have seen in terms of the decision-making from Ryan Day in a lot of cases. My guest this morning is Buckeye Scoop's X's and O's guru, Ross Fulton. He is here for our Thursday Chalk Talk. Ross, first of all, were you like a lot of other people sitting in front of your TV on Saturday wondering why the heck Ohio State was not just running the ball over and over in the first half? <laughs> I was. And so I, I have to say that, uh, like many people, when I watch the game the first time around, I watch it from more of the uh, live fan perspective. And then the second time around, you know, we could go through each individual decision. I think when when they were when they threw, I think some of them made more sense than others. And some of them, part of the problem was like the overall game management, not so much the calls themselves. Well, let's, let's start first of all with, okay, I don't think any of us saw the Trey Sermon breaks the school record thing coming on Saturday morning. <laughs> so what was it that Northwestern was doing that made it so, uh, you know, so easy or, so, you know, opened up the opportunity for Ohio State to run the ball that way? Yeah. So I think I've been doing this covering Ohio State in one form or another X and O since probably 2007, 2006. I don't think I've ever until this year encountered a situation where Ohio State, the opponent they played, has not tried to outnumber them in the run game in some way or other. And so when I say that, you know, Ohio State mostly aligns with three wide receivers and a tight end. And so you have basically six blockers. And the defense will generally try to put seven or eight guys up there to stop the run. Since both Indiana and this game in different ways, those opponents took a, we're going to stop the pass first strategy. And so that resulted in Ohio State basically having even numbers in the box. Uh, so they, you know, Northwestern would have five or six defenders against Ohio State's five or six blockers. And then you add in the fact that they have to account for Justin Re Fields on replays. And, you know, for the first time in a while, you get to see what the Ohio State offensive line can do when they, they are not getting blamed for not blocking someone who's not blocked as part of the scheme and so you know and then uh, obviously the rest is literally history as Trey Sermon set the single game rushing record as you said but you know so you start out with you get Trey Sermon pass on a scrimmage and then uh, he did a lot of it as well with a seeing cutbacks so part of it is you know we can sort of step take a step back and talk about what Northwestern did but you know they were slanting a lot and he was cutting back across the grain and then he is you know as he's getting more comfortable, you can really see his great feet in the hole. And so he's able to then make guys miss once he gets going. Yeah. So that was going to be my next question. Like how much of the success was a result of just X's and O's wins and just numbers advantages and how much of it was just the offensive line playing well, Sermon hitting the right holes and running through tackles. Like what, how would you assign those, those uh, percentages there? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's a good chunk of both. You know, I think it's, you start out with the fact, so, you know, as I discussed in my article, Northwestern basically, again, they wanted to keep two deep safeties, but they also wanted to be able to con confuse Justin Fields post snap by changing to a bunch of coverages. So to do that, they got to keep both those guys back there. And then Ohio State and Ryan Day, you know, obviously there's been a lot of criticism of the play calling, but to their credit, they saw quickly what was going on and they, they sort of, um, you know, took advantage of the situation by they aligned in a lot of trips, you know, putting three wide receivers to one side or even more so like unbalanced, made four wide receivers to one side. And that then pulled, you know, multiple Northwestern linebackers out of the box. And then so you, you again, you get that scheme edge. Then you give a, the Ohio State offensive line credit for blocking the guys they are assigned to block and, and successfully winning those. And then you get Trey Sermon credit for recognizing, again, like, you know, Ohio State, those mid zone and wide zone run plays have been sort of their bread and butter starting from last year. And what they've been missing this year a lot is like what JK Dobbins did last year, which is what Trey Sermon did on Saturday, which is like, you know, those plays are designed, you get the defense running lateral or moving laterally, and then you plant and you cut up field behind a lot of those guys. And so, you know, as I just said, to, to sort of make up for their numbers disadvantage, Northwestern was trying to slant their defensive line a lot, which basically means, they're trying to go guess which side the running back's going to run to and, you know, shift their defensive line that way at the snap. And so they were doing that. And the Ohio State offensive line was just washing them down and, and Trey Sermon was cutting behind. And then obviously, you know, from there, everything you gain in the secondary is, is all on the running back. 
Ryan Day talked after the game about how he wanted to stay aggressive. And, you know, that was why he had the Buckeyes, you know, keep trying to throw it in the first half. Is that, I mean, is that partly just him and Kevin Wilson not really believing in what they were seeing? Or they're worrying Northwestern's going to look at the fact that Ohio State's running the ball the way they are and go, well, we can't do that anymore and go away from it. And, you know, they don't want to spoil a good thing by hitting it too hard too early. Like what, what was, you know, what, what in your mind sort of led to that, you know, that play calling? Yeah, it's hard, right? So, I mean, so much of play calling is what's done during the week to prepare. And it's hard to really change on the fly. And you, you even have to wonder to what extent the game plan was already in place before Chris Olave was ruled out. I think for those, maybe to some extent, Chris Olave has been underrated in terms of his importance to the passing game. And I think that really came through on Saturday uh, because they were just missing so much of the timing and, and consistency of those intermediate routes that they just rely on so much. But um, I, you know, again, I think so much of what they were doing on Saturday was not just throwing per se. It was trying to break tendencies in terms of we're going to throw from certain formations and in certain situations where we would normally run it. Um, you know, I mean, yes, Ryan Day is aggressive in the sense that like that he particularly once they get into the opponents, like let's say past the 40 yard line, they, they love throwing deep in those situations, but they've been a pretty run heavy team in his tenure. And so it's, it's not like he's like a air raid guy throwing, you know, 60 times a game. So I, I think a lot of it was just situational. And then it, it just one of those games where it sort of backfired because without an Olave, they just could not get any rhythm going. I mean, you know, for instance, um, the, 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 the drive where they had the missed field goal. So it was second and two and they were, had obviously run the ball well up to that point. And they throw to Garrett Wilson in the end zone. Now they had Garrett Wilson one-on-one on a backup cornerback. You know, that's the kind of situation like you want to throw that pass. I mean, you can't really blame it. Obviously like hindsight's 2020. The problem really became that on third and two, they take a penalty because they were going so slow and they kept trying to check with me over and over again at the line of scrimmage. And then, you know, they third and seven happened. So in, in theory, second and two, you throw, you miss, you run on third down. And that, so it's more on, again, that game management kind of, fit them there well that was that was one towards the end of the first half where ohio state fans were not super happy with it there's another one later where they had third and four and ran like a slip screen to sermon you wrote in the article i mean you mentioned earlier breaking tendencies you thought that was a just all about breaking tendencies more than anything else so can you explain what breaking tendencies actually means and why it would be important to do that with clemson on deck sure and so a good example as well is the uh Fields a second interception to Jamison Williams. So that was, they ran a sprint out pass there out of pistol formation, which, you know, is the, the quarterback and shotgun and then the running back directly behind him. For Ohio State, pistol is a very run heavy formation because by having the tailback behind the, the quarterback, he's not nearly as effective as a blocker. And so normally, for instance, that when they run a sprint out play, like the, the tail, the halfback's going to be to the side they sprint out and he's going to block at the end of the line of scrimmage. And so that's a good example where they're basically presenting a formation to put on film that like, Hey, we're not, we don't just run it out of this every time or just throw play action out of this every time. Um, You know, similarly, the slip screen, uh, you know, they continue to try to sort of, that was a look where the offensive line, except for the right tackle blocked inside zone. So they tried to do a lot of things to prevent defenses going forward from knowing, Hey, if the, if the halfback is the line next to the quarterback, we're going to run the football the opposite side from the halfback. So we talked about slanting. So that's obviously a problem you always face is teams know overwhelmingly that they're going to run it away from the halfback. And so they did that. They also on the, the one touchdown Trey Sermon did, they faked like they were going to run a uh, zone away from the halfback and they ran that little option kind of speed option fake. And so some of the stuff did work. Some obviously didn't, um, but it was just clear throughout, uh, especially upon, you know, re- analyzing it that they were really putting an emphasis on trying to break tendencies whereas normally to me in a game that like they're going to win if it's third and four and you can gain a first down like you're going to run the ball twice whether it's giving it to the tailback or trying to feature justin fields in the you know near the goal line so i I think people might be listening to that and then wondering okay so if you know you have a tendency why would you not save it for clemson to break the tendency because you mean this is there's always a little bit of like I know that you know that I know that you know that I do this. So why would you 
knowing that you have this tendency, why would you break it for Northwestern and then have it on film for Clemson to go, aha, they don't always do this. They have this other thing where, I mean, if you're, if you have a real heavy tendency, that's almost a trick play if you do something that really like contradicts that tendency. So what's the advantage of doing it against Northwestern as opposed to saving that for, you know, as a surprise thing for Clemson? Yeah. Well, the glib answer is obviously if it didn't work very well. So you don't <laughs> tend to want to, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say, let's save it. But, you know, if it doesn't work and you're throwing a backward pass to Garrett Wilson to throw a, you know, a pass downfield, that's obviously a riskier endeavor um, or, or that throwback to Julian Fleming. I mean, there's really a lot of examples from that game. Um, you know, I, I, again, I, it is a balance. And I'm sure there are certain tendencies that they did not break in this game that they are saving. But I think what they want to be able to do is in a game where you're, everything's on the line, you really want to be able to run your offense. And so what they don't want is for Brett Venables and the Clemson defense to immediately, you know, slant away from the halfback, for instance, uh, as a good example, or, you know, immediately when they see pistol bring a certain blitz. Um, And so I think they really are. I think the goal probably was more, we need to put this on film now so that we can run our offense against a higher level of competition. Now, uh, right before half, there was another sequence that you wrote about that was just kind of odd. The Buckeyes had the ball right at the end of the first half and didn't go tempo, which we've seen them do. Didn't use timeouts, keep running the ball. I mean, that sounds like something that, you know, just the tempo, the pace of everything, just that that is going to be something that's going to have to change for that Clemson game. Yeah, and so I, th- that actually was one of the more perplexing sequences to me is why you you sit with two timeouts in your back pocket when you've, been running the ball so well you can call a timeout there you can run it once or or even run it without using a timeout if you need to call a timeout i mean again you know you have garrett wilson on a slot fade against a, a safety you you probably you know that's not a bad matchup in theory i mean the guy made an amazing play and there's a lot of technical issues on that where you know jameson williams need to get like a rub and, and so you know again it's easy for a coach to say well if we executed it better it would have worked However, I just I don't in general like going into halftime with timeouts sitting in your pocket when you could have used them. Um, the tempo issue, I, I, they were just so s- slow on Saturday doing a lot of check with me's. And I again wonder if that's a tendency breaker. So part of the issue was that just for Northwestern, that did not work very well because Northwestern was changing so many coverages post snap. You know, they'd show one thing, they'd show cover four, and then they'd roll to cover three that. I'm not sure how much that helped Ohio State, but it works even less well against Clemson because Brett Venables, A, is known for stealing signs. So that was an issue against Indiana, too, that they talked about. And so that's why they did a little bit of that huddle. So you're not going to get as much out of changing at the line of scrimmage. But every time, second thing is every time you check and change, he'll check and change. And so you're, you're kind of not getting a lot out of that. Now, Ohio State had a lot of success last year early using uh, – faster tempo. And so I, I do expect that. And so that's why, again, I wonder whether they're sort of trying to not lull Clemson so much, but just have Clemson prepare to, to deal with all those checks and then go faster tempo. Well, uh, Ross's article came out on uh, Tuesday this week. You can find that at BuckeyesGoop.com. It covers a lot of the stuff we talked about. There's a whole other thing. Ohio State also has a defense. He wrote all about that too. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just don't have don't have time to go into all that. It is a ton of great information, as always. So you can find that at BuckeyesGoop.com. Ross, also let people know where they can find you on Twitter. It is Ross R. Fulton. So there's and there's lots of good uh, Twitter conversation, as always, about scheme on there, and especially the passing game on Saturday to check out. Yeah, that that is uh, that's one that every once in a while I'll tweet something, and then Ross tweets something that's like, oh good, oh good, I'm right because Ross agrees with me. All right, that's good. So. Uh, <laughs> Ross is, Ross is a great follow on Twitter uh, as well, So as well as uh, at BuckeyeScoop.com. So, Ross, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you guys for uh, listening this morning. We will not have a morning scoop show tomorrow morning for Christmas. We will be back at it next Monday as we count down to the Sugar Bowl next Friday. Ross will be on at some point next week, I'm guessing, to uh, do more of a Clemson preview as opposed to a Northwestern look back. So you'll have that to look forward to. And uh, Tony Gerderman and I are planning to be down in New Orleans for a couple days before the game. Should be a fun time. Lots of good stuff to talk about. So uh, also make sure you check out BuckeyeScoop.com. Lots of good free content there. Also, just sign up. Sign up, be a member. Like it, There's so much incredible stuff on the Ask the Insiders board. The conversations have been incredible. 
I think we had 2000 posts on our game thread last week. Like it is, it is an incredible community. A lot of fun people. Um, really good time tomorrow's Christmas. I mean, you're running out of time. If you want, if you want that membership, ask someone right now, someone, someone is going to say, Oh man, um, I forgot to get you something. Well, just get me a Buckeye scoop membership, get sign up for a year. Then you uh, will get 12 months of great content all at BuckeyeScoop.com. Also make sure you check out all of our podcasts on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, just search Buckeye scoop to find all of those. You can uh, leave us a rating interview and also subscribe right there so you don't miss an episode. Thank you guys for joining us. Have a Merry Christmas. We will talk to you Monday.